All right, hello you guys. So I'm gonna be talking about topic uh, 5.10 and 5.11 in this lecture video. So, a ton of information to get through uh, with these two topics. Um, you know, a lot of vocabulary, a lot of concepts here. So, you know, if, if, you know, if I talk about it briefly, just know that it's for the sake of, of time and, and making sure, you know, we you at least get the, the introduction, so to speak, on, on some of these um, uh, concepts, okay? So um, topic um, 5.10, all right, let's talk about the consequences of agricultural practices, okay? And really, we're just gonna explain the, you know, environmental impacts and, and a little bit on the societal consequences. So um, safe to say that, you know, since the Green Revolution, um, you know, something that I think we've, you know, you guys have read about, you know, listened to and then written to death, right, about um, right, countries around the world have kind of shifted you know, and how they, you know, produce food, right? There's a focus on, on growing things as, as big and as fast as possible. Um, but, you know, you know, with all of the, you know, practices that we've looked at in this unit, right? All of, you know, the, 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 the concepts and things we've seen, right? The things we've watched, right? All leads to, um, um, you know, uh, long-term impacts, right? Some, some that we're still studying, right? Geographers and, you know, people around the world, but um, others that we can clearly see, right, the, the uh, intended or unintended consequences of, okay, in terms of food, air, you know, water pollution, the quality of our food, All right? So like, for instance, we've seen, right, an, an increase in, in livestock because of the increased demand in meat. So that's gonna lead to more animal waste. We've seen the increased use of chemicals, which is gonna lead to air and soil pollution. We've seen the impact of overgrazing, which, you know, could, could lead to uh, um, a desertification, for example, okay? And so the image that you see here, as you can tell, right, it's just looking at greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural, forestry, and other land use. And we can kind of see, um, right, what the largest uh, emitters, right, in, in Aflu are, right? <laughs> we can see, you know, uh, you know manure, for example, uh, synthetic fertilizers, crop residues, and savanna burning. Right, you can see that a lot of it comes from energy, right, from agriculture, forestry, and other land use. And so, you know, a bunch of the top or concepts in these two topics is really looking at, right, how can, um, what are some of the advances in agriculture and, and, and trying to make it uh, more sustainable in practice, okay? Um, because, you know, as I think most of you are well aware of, right, um, kind of the need to be, uh, you know, care for the environment and, you know, kind of stop the, the impacts of climate change, right? All of that has, has taken, um, you know, a major uh, uh, spot in politics in the world in the last, you know, 20, 30 years, okay? So anyways, um, let's look at the uh, environmental effects here of, um, of, uh, of agriculture, right? The, the environmental consequences, okay? So the environmental effects of agricultural land use include pollution, land cover change, desertification, soil salinization, and conservation efforts. Okay, so we're gonna start off with, uh, with pollution here. Okay, <clears throat> and you know, when we talk about pollution in the context of, of this topic, right, we're really talking about, you know, uh, you know, water and soil, right, even though here it just says soil, right? So, you know, um, pollution, you know, water pollution, right, you know, with, with the advances um, in agriculture, right, and the use of, of fertilizer, fertilizers and pesticides, right? Um, we have water running and, you know, other practices like irrigation, you know, we have water running off um, from farmland, right, um, you know, outside to the uh, rest of the agro ecosystem, right? Some of the water uh, runoff, right, from the field um, might contain chemicals and nutrients, right, from pesticides and fertilizers, maybe bacteria as well, right, disease carrying organisms, right? And usually the water that's running off here is gonna have, you know, high concentration of nitrate from fertilizer, from fertilizers, and that's gonna promote um, uncontrolled plant growth and, and low oxygen levels in bodies of water, right? Like lakes and oceans and, and whatnot. And we can see a good example of that in the, in the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. Um, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, it's about the size of, of Massachusetts. And here we see, um, marine life has been killed by oxygen deprivation because of the, the human caused uh, nutrient pollution. Again, the water running off uh, from the fields, okay. 
um, land cover change. Uh, when geographers, you know, refer to land cover change, they're just describing, you know, how the surface of land is altered by different land uses, or, you know, which agricultural areas are lost to development. Okay, so terrace farming is an example. We'll get to that uh, later on. Um, but, um, you know, with, with land cover change, right, not only can we see a landscape change, but we can, uh, you know, see, see the uh, long-term effects, right? On the uh, on the fields, right? So with like terrace farming, for example, um, you know, a problem associated with terracing is is ground to water saturation, and that's going to hinder the land's ability to absorb more water during heavy rains, right? Uh, not only does terracing require more labor, right, but it's uh, you know if, if uh, you know if it isn't maintained, right, the state of you know the farms, uh, that's going to lead to soil deterioration, soil erosion, and um, that can lead to severe and then cause um, uh, severe problems and cause catastrophic mudslides during rainy seasons. Rain deforestation is another um, example of land cover change that's caused by slash and burn, the slash and burn technique, right? Uh, but again, that can lead to uh, to long term impacts. Okay, and um, you know if you remember all the way back in Unit One, you guys you know read about this and. Uh, Looking at the, the Amazon rainforest, right, in, in Brazil, and, and um, you know how that's you know altering the way um, you know land is being used there, and then the whole landscape. Okay, we looked at that. Okay, other environmental effects. Um, we've got desertification here, right? Um, you know this is going to be you know basically you know all over the world, parts of Africa, North America, Central America, Southwest Asia, the Middle East. Right, Eastern Europe, and desertification is you know the, that process by which fertile land or arable land we could say um, becomes desert, right, as a result of various human activities, right. Um, you know, part part of it, you know, the reason for des desertification, right, could be poor uh, pastoral uh, nomadism practices, right, like overgrazing, other causes. Um, I already said overgrazing, right, deforestation. Right, and uh, clearing of land for uh, expanding human habitation. All right, and the areas most vulnerable to desertification are those with, with low or, or variable rainfall. Right, one third of all farmland in India, for example, is now affected by desertification. And the UN reports um, that desertification is occurring at about 30, 35 times faster than the historical rate, which, um, you know, it's, it's a bit shocking when you think about it, right? And um, we can see what, which, um, you know, regions of the world, right, in, in each specific continent are vulnerable uh, to desertification, right? And we can see the Sahel here in Africa is, is quite vulnerable um, to that, you know, parts of, uh, of the United States, right, here in, you know, in the West, right, the Middle East, right, some in Australia. Right, but then there's also this map here, right? The risk of human induced desertification, okay, because of you know practices, and again, these agricultural practices like uh, oops, pastoral nomadism, okay. We well, can see, um, you know, again, it's you know, right below the Sahel. And we watched that video in class again, right, about the, the whole problem of desertification in the Sahara and that it's expanding in you know, um, you know, ways different, right? The African Union is trying to combat that. Okay, but again, we can see, um, you know, just how, how far um, in the world, um, right, our practices might lead to, to consequences like certification. Okay, again, the cell here is, uh, you know, a, a case study, you know, some, something that we watched in class and kind of looked at, right. Other environmental effects include soil salinization. Right, the process by which salt increases in the soil. So, right, when salt accumulates in the root zone of a crop, right, this is soil salinization, the, you know, better definition, right? When salt accumulates in the root zone of a crop, um, you know, that, you know, when that happens, the, the plant can no longer extract adequate water and that can uh, in turn result in crop yield reductions. Okay, um, irrigation, you know, that, that agricultural practice can lead to salinization. Um, Egypt, um, for example, right, has been struggling with, with uh, soil salinization um, uh, issues uh, because of extensive irrigation, right? Um, so, yeah, you know, the, the way 
the way to understand it is, you know, essentially, you know, the Egyptians have kind of, you know, built, um, you know, dams and irrigations to kind of control uh, floods, right? To kind of control, right, um, how much water, right, can go into their, their fields and right into, you know, the, some of the more populated areas in Egypt. But because of this, um, it's kind of led to, um, you know, an increase in, in salt in the soil and, you know, you can't, you know, the natural process by which to, it's washed away is, as, um, you know, it's kind of led to some of the soil being, uh, um, I wouldn't say, you know, um, dead, but, you know, isn't, isn't as valuable anymore. Okay. Um, anyways, soil salinization mainly occurs in arid and semi-arid regions, right? When water evaporates from the ground more rapidly and then it's replenished by rain or irrigation. Okay, so um, you can see, right, soil at its, you know, various points and, um, right, we can see what soil looks like when it's, you know, um, the word is, uh, I believe is uh, salinated, right? <laughs> Saline soil, your sodic soil here is highly suitable soil, right? It looks normal. Poor drainage, right? Of course, we can see some, some puddles there. Um, but here we can see what soil might look like, right? When it's, uh, you know, um, salinated. <laughs> okay. Other environmental effects, of course, include conservation efforts. Um, uh, so there have been a lot of efforts right in the last, you know, well, basically, you know, 30, 40 years, right, to kind of um, uh, uh, sustain um, and kind of, you know, limit the negative environmental effects of agriculture. Right? So there have been policies and then efforts by different countries to, uh, to do all that. But, you know, conservation efforts, they've shown mixed results um, from place to place. Some places have been very successful. Um, for example, to conserve water, the government of Zambia in Southern Africa charges fees on, on groundwater use. All right, the money, the money they collect is then used to, to address the problems of water pollution. But of course, um, not all, not all um, efforts have been um, exactly successful. All right, if we get a little bit more specific into commercial farming, right, there are goals to reduce uh, from agribusinesses Rules to reduce air pollution from heavy machinery, or encourage a better stewardship of water resources, um, et cetera. Okay, now we could look at further examples with uh, subsistence farming, but um, I think there, there are other things that, uh, <laughs> that we could look at, All right? <clears throat> okay, so um, agricultural practices. Um, so, you know, we could have, I could have done it the other way. I talked about agricultural practices first. And then, you know, environmental impacts of, of agricultural practices, all right. Um, but we could look at the impacts of specific agricultural practices, okay. So um, agricultural practices include slash and burn, uh, terraces, irrigation, deforestation, draining wetlands, shifting cultivation of pastoral nomadism, right, and all of these alter the landscape, all right. Some of them I won't talk about in depth because, you know, we've already learned about, right, like slash and burn, right, a type of shifting agricultural that permanently alters the landscape. Right, and you know, slash and burn, um, you know, you could go back to a topic, uh, you know, 5.1 and, and 5.2 and, and, uh, <clears throat> and get into all of that. But again, slash and burn, right, not to beat it to death, um, but you know, it involves cutting and burning forest to create fields or crops. Or right, anyways, this contributes massively uh, to deforestation, right, the loss of forest lands and, and, uh, and soil erosion. Right, and people who most often practice slash and burn are going to be the tropical wet climates where, where you know, there's a lot of vegetation covering the land, right? Um, so, you know, while there is some, you know, benefits to the slash and burn technique and, you know, and while it does tear down parts of the rainforest, um, you know, doing that is going to put more CO2 um, into the atmosphere. And um, as some of you might know, right, um, rainforests and you know specifically you know the Amazon rainforest um, you know clearly um, you know absorbs millions you know of tons of carbon emissions every year and um, you know scientists right even they've you know, done studies and researches right um, that show that rainforests are, are instrumental in slowing climate change so slash and burn isn't um, necessarily helping in that sense Okay, 
Um, so yeah, I talked about deforestation here, right? The clearing of the forest to make the land available for, for other uses caused by the slash, slash and burn agriculture. All right, other agricultural practices with unintended consequences, again, are gonna be uh, terraces, right? Flat steps created on the sides of hills to create more land for farming. All right, you'll mainly find these in Southeast Asia, but you know, again, there's steps on the side of mountains with rain and water running down the steps, right? Irrigating the crops. It's very labor intensive, but it does maximize um, you know, the land available, right? Um, so an example of environmental possibilism again, right? We looked at terraces in, back in Unit 1, uh, but this method is used in mountainous areas of various climates, right? right through terracing or hilly, uh, through terracing hilly or mountainous lands that would otherwise be unusable become productive, all right? So farmers can uh, cultivate crops, right? In these uh, rugged regions, right? So here's some examples. Uh, they build steps or terraces in, in the steep slopes and create paddies for cultivating water intensive crops like rice. So during rainfall, the paddies flood and water flows through small channels from terrace to terrace, okay? But again, um, there are some, uh, you know, dangerous impacts or dangerous consequences uh, when it comes to terracing, you're right. Um, it's very labor intensive. So, you know, if, if you're not working and keeping it all um, and not maintaining, right, uh, the, the fields, uh, there could be some, you know, uh, catastrophic mudslides in the area. Okay. And just look up photos of, of terraces. Um, they're pretty impressive. Um, you, know, um, you know, they are really, you know, a piece of work. So um, definitely look it up on your own time. Then. Other agricultural practices include, uh, you know, irrigation, right? The artificial application of water to land for the facilitation of agriculture, basically moving water from one place to another, right? To make sure that crops have access to water. All right, so kind of diverting water from its natural course um, to aid in the production of, of, uh, of, of crops in another place. Okay, so human beings, you know, have used irrigation for thousands of years, right? It's, it's been proven, right, <laughs> to produce more crops and um, irrigation supports, uh, um, well, specifically supports small subsistence farmers, right? More so than commercial agricultural operations. Not to say that they don't use irrigation though, um, but through irrigation, humans have transformed the arid and semi-arid landscapes into, you know, green fields, right? Um, the only problem with uh, irrigation, though, is that it can disrupt natural drainage of water and uh, result in salinization, right? Um, in other words, irrigation can deplete fresh water sources from other places, right? Because, you know, well, you could say the water is being um, stolen, right, from another, another place. And, Again, we looked at this back in unit one with the impact, uh, you know, with the, uh, the RLC case study, right? Um, and we see how the RLC has, has shrunken and, you know, it's basically non-existent. Um, so you could revisit that and take a look, um, all right? But, uh, you know, irrigation, while it does have its benefits, like some of the other agricultural practices that we've looked at, can lead to uh, soil and, and water pollution. Okay. Another agricultural practice here is uh, draining wetlands, right? So uh, drainage for, uh, so I should say, right? Wetlands, right? Are areas of land that are covered or saturated, covered by or saturated with water. So, um, you know, think of, um, let's see, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, take a look at my notes here, you guys, all right? Yeah, like swamps, marshes, bogs, right? Those are wetlands, right? And wetlands um, naturally act as, you know, often act as natural filters that protect and promote uh, surface water and, and ground water quality. All right, the Netherlands stands out about 17% of the country's uh, present land area was once under the sea or coastal wetland. But anyways, the agricultural practice of draining wetlands is literally draining the wetlands to convert them into farmlands, right? Um, you know, once that's done, you know, you know, farmers will find that the soil is rich in nutrients, right? And, you know, of course, increasing farmlands. The drawback to this, though, is that it reduces uh, biodiversity in plants and animals, right? Um, 
Another issue as well is that wetlands usually help reduce storm and flood damage and improve water quality and trap CO2. So by you know draining the wetlands, uh, that's gonna lead to um, uh, water and air pollution. Okay. And pastoral nomadism, we talked about that in another topic, right? Pasture lands used for animal grazing. And that can also lead to uh, certification. All right, um, societal effects here. Um, agricultural practices include changing diets, the role of women in agricultural production, economic purpose. Okay, so, I mean, the big takeaway, at least for this um, subtopic here, is that consumers in many countries have altered their diet and lifestyle choices in reaction to recent innovations in agriculture, right? So um, many consumers, you know, especially in urban areas are purchasing organically grown foods because they believe it's better for the environment and um, for their own bodies, you know, and some of you probably have already, you know, made this decision, right? <laughs> to be more environmentally conscious, right? Um, we'll talk about the role of women in agricultural production in topic 5.12. Okay. So here's a little, uh, you know, um, uh, bar graph for you here. I'm just kind of looking at the female share uh, population economically active in agriculture, right? So um, anyways, uh, that's topic 5.10. Again, a lot of it's just looking at, at the consequences of agricultural practices, specifically, right, the environmental impacts, not necessarily, you know, the economic or social or political, but definitely the, the environmental. And, um, you know, there's a uh, uh, a lot of issues uh, uh, to uh, discuss there. All right, but now we're going to talk about the challenges of uh, contemporary agriculture. Okay, a lot of information on this one as well. A little bit more than five point ten, actually. <laughs> Let me get a drink of water first. So, the learning objective in this topic is to explain challenges and debates related to the changing nature of contemporary agriculture and food production practices. So let's talk about agricultural innovations um, first. Okay. So, um, you know, agricultural innovations, you know, like biotechnology, GMOs, aquaculture, you know, these are all, um, I've caused debates, right, over questions of, you know, biodiversity, sustainability, soil and water usage, right, and, and you know, uh, fertilizer and pesticide use, right. And again, like I said in the beginning of the lecture, kind of this topic and the last topic is looking at um, sustainable agriculture, right, in regards to um, environmental, economic, and social practices, right. So more, an ever increasing number of farmers um, are learning to manage uh, the environment in a way that minimizes pollution or pollution of the air, soil, and water, right? So that um, uh, continued productivity is ensured, right? In short, <laughs> you know, these, some of these, uh, you know, agricultural innovations are causing debates, right? About whether or not um, agriculture is is on the road to, to being sustainable or whether or not we're, we're actually, you know, hurting the environment, okay? So let's talk about these agricultural innovations. So um, biotechnology, that's something that we looked at, you know, with the Green Revolution, um, the science of altering living organisms through genetic manipulation, right? Um, so, you know, modifying plants and animals either to make them uh, pesticide resistant, right? Whether we were giving them uh, antibiotics, right? Um, whether or not we're, you know, uh, giving them genes to make them, you know, grow larger, right, or faster. Um, so with that, that's kind of led to, uh, um, to GMOs, right? Genetically modified organisms, okay? And again, <laughs> I feel like I'm saying this a lot, right? We talked about that in 5.5, right? Plants or animals whose DNA has been genetically modified. And, um, the question here, right, is um, whether or not, um, you know, biotechnology or, or GMO is actually, is actually, you know, um, a good thing, right? Is it necessary to solve world hunger, right? Supporters argue, right, that, uh, you know, all of this is needed to, uh, um, to reduce uh, world hunger. Um, to kind of, uh, you know, 
um, make sure everybody, you know, is, isn't, isn't starving. Okay. Um, you know, bi biotechnology, um, also GMOs, right, can result in improvements, right? We already talked about that. Um, but, you know, even while it's also reducing, you know, the cost of food production, um, many feel that, you know, GMOs and, and biotechnology, you know, haven't been, you know, studied enough to, so that we can really understand, you know, the environmental impacts of these, okay? What is clear though, is that, you know, chemical fertilizers, and pesticides are, you know, polluting the water and soils, right? Um, I should say, right, the, the, the fertilizers and pesticides used because of the green revolution. Okay. So all of that's kind of leading to, uh, to separate issues. Also fossil fuels for farming machines. Again, this is all kind of going back to 5.5 and kind of the, the positives and negatives, right, of the green revolution. Right. Other agricultural innovations, right, um, and questions, right, um, debates included the reduction in biodiversity. So the variety and variability of plants and animals and microorganisms, right, that are used directly or indirectly for food and, and agriculture. So agricultural biodiversity is integral to environmentally sustainable um, agriculture, but many are arguing, you know, that biotechnology and, and GMOs and and genetic engineering and all of that and crops has kind of uh, reduced um, the amount of crop diversity, right? Uh, in the United States and in the world, right? And you can see in this map, you know, just, you know, the effective number of crop species, right? And you can see the, the proliferation here of, of you know, the orange and red, red um, uh, counties here, right? And a reduction of, of these, you know, dark blue uh, counties here. Okay, you know, all of this has, has also led to uh, um, soil fertility, okay, um, which is also uh, obviously a big concern, right? Um, so soil fertil fertility, uh, that's declined with, with the intensification of food production. Uh, you know, that's to say land productivity is lessened, okay. All right, and another agricultural innovation that's subject to debate is uh, aquaculture, right? The raising of fish and sell shellfish and ponds and, and controlled saltwater hatcheries. So this is a type of, of uh, you know, fish farming, right? Uh, that's using less space and it's a little bit more care intensive than other types of agriculture and represents one of the fastest growing production sections in the world. All right, so. Um, aquaculture can provide enormous and consistent amounts of fish and seafood. It's helped to, to meet current seafood demands. Um, you know, that, those are the benefits, right? But the concerns, you know, are, you know, water pollution from chemicals used in fish farming, excess, excess nutrients like fish waste, the use of antibiotics, which, you know, may transfer disease and parasites to, to wild fish population. Also, you know, high fish density in the open pen systems, right, might lead to uh, the spread of diseases. Right, fish might be able to escape from the pens. It might breed with, with other fishes, and you know, um, you know, as you know, the, the body of water they're in. If they escape, right, there will be competition for the resources in that body of water. Um, so yeah, uh, the other subtopic here with five point eleven is going to be patterns of food production and consumption. All right, now these are so patterns of food production and consumption. They're influenced by movements related to individual food choice, like urban farming, community supported agriculture, organic farming, value added specialty crops, fair trade, local food movements, and dietary shifts. Okay, so let's talk about these, right? So, uh, a pattern of a food production and consumption, again, right? Um, that's, you know, being, you know, an influence is going to be local food movements, right, such as urban farming. And urban farming, you know, is basically uh, converting vacant lots, rooftops, or abandoned buildings, right, in cities, um, into spaces to grow produce. Okay, and I should say, right, the local food movements, um, you know, including urban farming and CSA, which I'll talk about in a moment, they're aiming to connect food producers and food consumers in the same geographic regions, you know, because a lot of, you know, um, um, choices and patterns of food production today. Um, 
is uh, as a result of you know some of these agricultural innovations and you know the issues um, involved with them, some of the controversies. So, anyways, urban farming again is basically converting you know you know the rooftops and lots and cities to uh, to gardens. In other words, okay. So, um, you know, a lot of it, you know, is, is pretty safe and easy to do. It's gonna reduce transportation and thus fossil fuel use. It's gonna strengthen the relationship between those who, who grow the food and those who eat it. And they allow the public to be more aware of where their food comes from, right? And so that's what people really wanna know these days, right? Where food's coming from, right? Um, so community supported agriculture is basically when farmers sell crops to local consumers who agree to purchase those products throughout the year. In other words, consumers purchase shares in the output of a local farm, right? So these are individuals who, you know, make the pledge, right? To support a, a local farm, right? So that, you know, growers and consumers are kind of working together, right? Uh, and helping each other out. So here are some examples of urban farming. Um, another pattern of food production and consumption um, and influence is going to be organic farming, right? Crops produced without the use of synthetic or industrially produced pesticides and fertilizers or genetically engineered seeds, right? This has seen a rise in popularity in some areas in response to concerns about chemical inputs and GMOs. So it's a little bit more expensive than traditional farming, um, but wealthier consumers in the US and elsewhere have shown that they're willing to pay uh, these higher prices. So organic farmers are gonna use natural fertilizers like plant-based products or animal manure to promote long-term health soil. Organic farmers are also gonna to attempt to reduce or eliminate external agricultural inputs and strive for sustainability. Other influences um, of patterns of food production and consumption uh, <clears throat> is gonna be fair trade, right? And, um, you know, uh, with fair trade, you know, essentially, um, you know, consumers just, you know, um, are basically want to know, right? Like who, who created or who grew, you know, this food, right? Or these foods, right? And, <laughs> you know, who grew them, right? Um, you know, is the wage practice fair, right? Or, you know, they protecting the farmers. So that's what fair trade is. But, um, you know, with fair trade, uh, that's going to bypass, you know, traditional multinational corporations, right? And, uh, you know, uh, it's going to also uh, kind of bypass contracts directly with farmers. Okay, so um, there's been a global campaign as of late to uh, fix, you know, unfair wage practices and, um, you know, make sure farmers are being treated uh, right in other parts of the world. Right, so fair trade producers, um, you know, typically are going to uh, treat workers better and pay them more money. And so consumers, especially here in the United States, want to make sure that, you know, their food is, you know, from, from fair trade, right, from fair trade practices. Okay. Um, so yeah, value added specialty crops manufacturing processes that increase the value of primary agricultural commodities. Right, so um, organic or other specialty crops that are transformed. Another way to think about it, right, is that organic or, or other specialty crops that are transformed from their original state to a more valuable state. So, you know, just think of, um, you know, milk, for example, right, converting milk into cheese or yogurt. Um, so, consumer demand for value added products uh, can be driven, right, by a desire to eat healthier, right, more nutritious foods or for convenience. Right. For example, it's a lot of consumers, you know, are going to buy yogurt because they enjoy the taste, right? They believe in the health benefits of yogurt. Um, and so these same consumers wouldn't consider taking the time and trouble to make yogurt. So, you know, even if they found that their you know, own yogurt, you know, might, might cost less, right? Um, you know, they're going to want it for maybe convenience, right? So those are value added uh, specialty crops, all right? Influencing patterns of food production and consumption, right? Dietary shifts. So lately, um, you know, there's been a, a movement to move away from processed foods, meat and sugar towards the one more based on fruits and vegetables, or even just more, you know, um, I guess healthier meat, if we can say, right? Meat with more uh, nutrition, right? So, you know, aside from an increase in, you know, wanting fruits and vegetables, there's been a, a, an increase in, you know, 
um, people wanting rice, chicken, turkey, right? And, and cutting down on, on red meat, milk, uh, potatoes, right? So global trends in diets are also going to influence um, agriculture, right? So, um, you know, we've seen more farms, you know, around the world focusing on, on growing chickens and, and turkeys and, and all of them, okay? So, um, Number three here, challenges of feeding a global population. So um, the challenges of feeding a global, global population include a lack of food access, like in cases of food insecurity, food deserts, problems with distribution systems, adverse weather, oh, and land loss to suburbanization. So nearly 11% of the world's population is going to experience food insecurity and major causes are, are these listed here, okay. But let's talk about them individually. So here's a global map here, um, a national scale of analysis, right, of, of world hunger. So, I mean, unsurprisingly, right, we can see that, you know, large parts of Africa, of Asia are experiencing world hunger, right, when compared to most of, um, you know, the developed world, all right. So one challenge of feeding a global population, or pop population, <laughs> not population, um, is going to be food insecurity, right? The state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious foods. Okay, so the Food and Agriculture Organization of the, of the UN reported in 2018 that more than 700 million people suffered um, from food insecurity. In the United States, the number is about 40 million. So, you know, food insecurity is a result of uh, distribution issues and economic decisions about what to do with the crops that are produced. Um, you know, the number here, uh, the UN reported, um, you know, was that about 55% uh, of the world's overall, um, you know, crops, right, are fed to people, um, while the other, you know, 45% goes to livestock and goes to uh, making biofuels like ethanol, right? Um, you know, again, weather is, is an issue. Um, uh, adverse weather, I should say, right? Like severe storms, droughts, extreme temperatures, right? All caused or intensified by climate change, right? So more than 80% of uh, food insecure people in the world live in areas susceptible to these extreme weather events, all right? But even uh, relatively food secure regions are vulnerable to these, you know, adverse, adverse, uh, you know, adverse weather, right? You know, another reason why, you know, people might, um, um, experience food insecurity is uh, the loss of agricultural land to growing urban areas, all right? Um, specifically, you know, we could think of suburbanization, the shifting of population from cities to the suburbs, okay? So as people want to move away to the cities, right, there's a greater demand to, you know, um, make towns and homes, right, just on the outskirts of the city. Um, but that's, uh, you know, impacting uh, agriculture um, because, you know, as some argue, right, um, the reduction in the amount of, of land available for, you know, food production is going to lower that ratio of, of food producers to uh, food consumers. Okay. So, you got that there with food insecurity. Okay. So, with food insecurity, um, we could look at, you know, more specific food issues um, such as food deserts. All right, geographic areas where affordable, healthy food options are scarce or missing. And you'll typically find food deserts in, in urban, low-income neighborhoods. Okay, so um, food deserts, you know, these are communities, you know, that are, you know, typically more than a mile away from supermarkets or grocery stores. All right, you know, you'll, in these, these communities, right, you'll see, you know, um, high unemployment, see poverty rate, high poverty rates, um, you know, you'll see these people living in food deserts in these communities um, going to convenience stores and fast food restaurants simply because of, again, convenience not very far, within a walking distance, cheaper prices, um, and about 23 and a half million Americans live in these food deserts. So people who live in food deserts, they're going to, you know, experience high rates of obesity, diabetes, and other illnesses. Right, so what might cause food deserts? Right, poor access to transportation, for example. Right, a lot of people who live in food deserts, you know, don't have 
you know, vehicles, right? Cars, uh, lack of an automobile. Um, you know, that can result in a lack, uh, in a lack of access to grocery stores um, because a lot of grocery stores are, you know, could, are, you know, are in suburbs, right? Or kind of could, near the, um, I don't want to say the more well-off neighborhoods and cities, but, you know, they're definitely not in, 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 in poverty-stricken areas. You know, um, another cause might be that some stores might avoid neighborhoods, right, with low-income minority or immigrant populations. Right, another is simply going to be poverty. Right, people just don't have the the, the money to, you know, to, to purchase um, from, um, you know, grocery stores that are far. Um, and something else I should add to, to poor access to transportation is kind of the the unequal access maybe to public transportation as well. Right, there are some areas that are going to lack public transportation. Right, immediately in you know in their vicinity. Uh, here in Portland, you know, Trima is, does a good job of, you know, making sure that, you know, most communities have easy access to, you know, the, the, the buses and, you know, the max lanes, but other parts of, of the United States, not so much, okay. Um, but anyways, other parts of, of the United States, you know, might lack public transportation areas with supermarkets, but also declining investment in low-income neighborhoods. Um, I guess businesses are just not seeing the benefits of, of uh, of, you know, making, um, you know, their stores in, in low-income neighborhoods. So here's the map, oops, here's the map we can see of, um, you know, um, counties and, you know, what percentage of people don't have a car and don't have uh, access to a supermarket within a mile. So we can really see it, you know, in the South. And again, we saw this in class, but here in Portland, right, we can see, um, you know, some um, some examples here of, uh, of food deserts, right, in the United States. All right. Um, so this one, we kind of see it in Chicago as well, right, some examples. All right. And I thought this was an interesting, um, you know, image as well to look at, right. We can see... Um, you know, what percentage of people in Vancouver, you know, can walk to get food and, you know, compared to Portland or even Seattle. All right, so, um, yeah, close to finishing off this, um, you know, this lecture here, you know, economic impact on food productions, right? So the location of, of food processing facilities and markets, economies of scale, distribution systems and government policies all have economic effects on food production practices. Um, so we don't need to really talk about right, economies of scale here, all right? But something that you know should be mentioned on the economic impact of food production, um, you know, is is going to be uh, you know storage and transportation issues. Um, so you know, farms, food processing facilities, and the markets where foods are sold are located, you know, um, pretty far, uh, pretty far distances from one another. Um, so because of that, you know, food is often going to spoil before it reaches a market, right? Either because of a lack of, you know, storage facility means. Um, and, you know, we might, you know, see this more in developing countries where they, you know, lack transportation systems, right? Um, successful ones, right, to get to food markets. And, you know, there are also problems with government bureaucracies that can, that can hinder food um, distribution as well. All right. But there is a growing, um, growing trend here of improving infrastructure. Um, so, you know, it can strengthen the ability of farmers to develop sustainable businesses and, and reduce waste and, and increase food access. All right. Anyways, um, yeah, there we go with the topics, you guys. So um, a lot of concepts here um, to think about. Highly recommend you look at the, uh, you know, what's, what's important uh, to learn about, right? You know, what's, what exactly is the connection, right? Rather than just, you know, knowing what, you know, urban farming is on its own, okay? Anyways, let me know if you have questions, you guys. And um, yeah, we'll lay mark on the assignments <laughs> again. Anyways, let me know if you have questions. <laughs>